Şuraya. All right, good morning. Welcome to today's presentation, uh, ILM 310-302M in measurement, uh, ultrasonic flow meters. Um, we've discussed the science and technology behind uh, ultrasonic measurement earlier when we talked about ultrasonic level measurement uh, procedures. Uh, the science behind ultrasonic flow meters is exactly the same as the science behind uh, ultrasonic level. Um, specifically in this ILM, we are going to be looking at two different types of ultrasonic flow meters, uh, both of them represented here on the screen uh, in these images. On the left, you see we have something called a time of flight flow meter. Uh, and the basic principle of operation for a time of flight flow meter is that it will shoot an ultrasonic pulse uh, across the flow stream in, in one direction, in this case going with the flow stream. Uh, this takes a certain amount of time for the sound wave to get from the transmitter to the receiver. And then it also in return shoots a pulse back uh, from this side back to a receiver in the other sensor and measures the time it takes to flow going backwards. A uh, common analogy that I use for this particular device is if you were uh, sitting in the middle of a river here, if this was a river and you were in your canoe and you were to um, be paddling along the river here, um, the amount of time, you know, let's say you're on this side of the river and you want to, uh, you want to paddle across to this side of the river, uh, you're going with the flow of the current, you're going to be able to paddle across this way relatively quickly uh, in comparison, if you were then on the other side of the river and you had to paddle your way back against the current, you would find that it takes you longer to get back to where you started than it did uh, when you departed. And that's the, um, the best analogy I can give for how this time of flight flow meter works. So it measures the time that it takes for you to get from this side to this side going with the flow. Uh, and then measures you going from this side to this side against the flow. Uh, with the flow, you're going to be faster. Against the flow, you're going to be slower. And from these time measurements, um, we can derive a flow rate uh, from uh, the signals that we receive. The second style that we look at, uh, look at here on the left, on the right hand side here is called a Doppler flow meter. Uh, still uses sound. Uh, with a transmitter and a receiver, but the major difference between time of flight and Doppler is that Doppler flow meters rely heavily on particles, suspended solids, or bubbles within the flow stream uh, in order to reflect the ultrasonic sound wave back to the receiver. So uh, pretty significant difference where this goes all the way across the pipe uh, and gets shot, shot back again. Uh, the Doppler style um, sends out a pulse which is reflected off of a particle and and received. So that's the major difference. This is a uh, time of flight generally used for clean flow applications and Doppler flow meters can be used and actually require some type of suspended solids, particles, or bubbles in the flow stream. Um, so that's a pretty good general outline of what we're going to be looking at today. Our objectives, uh, principles and applications, components, advantages and limitations, installation and maintenance and calibration for ultrasonic flow meters. So quick little image here of uh, what it looks like for this transit time uh, with some numbers attached to it showing that the time going against the grain is faster or sorry, slower than it is going with the flow. And this is the technology that is used to drive uh, our flow rate. Okay, ultrasonic measures uh, fluid velocity by passing high frequency sound waves along a fluid path. The flow is derived from how that sound travels. Uh, as I said already, we're going to be looking at two specific types, the Doppler style and the transit style. So we'll start out with Doppler. A uh, little bit of humor video for you. Um, 
I don't know if it's worth my time to play this or not. Actually, I'm probably not going to play this. Uh, this video is a link to um, Big Bang Theory, uh, Sheldon uh, dressing up as the Doppler effect for Halloween. I'm not going to play this one. Um, but what's being represented by this diagram here is the difference in the frequency of the sound waves um, as something is approaching you or leaving you. Um, the ILM um, makes a comparison to a train. Um, lots of us uh, have heard trains, of course, and if we thought about it for a second, you would realize that you can distinguish the sound that a train makes uh, as it's approaching versus the sound that a train makes as it is leaving. And that is uh, a good representation of what happens with the Doppler effect. So similarly illustrated here with an ambulance, an approaching ambulance will have a higher frequency uh, wavelength as it, as, it, as it approaches you. And as the ambulance is leaving you, that apparent wavelength uh, seems to be longer or lower frequency. The comparison is made between the frequencies uh, of the transmitted and the returning wave. And that wave again is lower as it moves away and higher as it moves closer. Doppler relies on bubbles or particles to reflect the sound waves, uh, not an ambulance or a train. So here's a uh, little diagram here again showing that the sound wave, uh, sound wave is transmitted out, reflected off of some particles or bubbles and returned back to the transducer. Okay, here the ultrasonic burst again, probably getting into this too many times. The ultrasonic waves are reflected back by the particles in the fluid. Uh, there is a difference in frequency, and that difference between the transmitted and received frequencies is called something called the beat frequency. Uh, once we have that uh, beat frequency, the electronics of the transmitter will be able to uh, convert those signals into a volumetric flow rate, again, using our standard uh, formulas for volumetric flow. Uh, flow of volumetric, uh, volumetric flow is simply a uh, combination of the velocity of the fluid flowing and the cross-sectional area uh, of the pipe. Transit time, a little bit different here. This is the second technology that we're looking at in the ILM here. Uh, not a significant uh, amount of differences, but there is one very particular uh, significant difference that we have to make sure that we wrap our heads around. Uh, this meter measures the time it takes for an ultrasonic pound to, uh, a pulse to traverse the pipe. So this has to traverse the pipe. It's not reflected back off of the particles. First, uh, the signal again is uh, against the flow and then with the flow or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. The difference in the two travel times is directly proportional to the velocity of the flow. We have to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, flow profile issues. We've mentioned flow profile issues before when we've talked uh, about laminar flow and turbulent flow. Uh, and this is a good little image to show you uh, ideal situations here where we get a velocity profile and laminar flow, uh, where we have nice layers of flow and a good velocity profile on the front of our flow stream uh, versus image B here, which is uh, turbulent flow, you can see everything going in every which way uh, it, it can go. Um, the thing that's problematic ultrasonic wise with this is depending on where that ultrasonic beam is being uh, shown or transmitted to, uh, it could get redirected by some of the turbulence in the pipe. If this is a Doppler style, uh, the swirling bubbles can cause some errors. Ultrasonic uh, has uh, evolved to the point where there is now provisions that will help us deal for less than ideal flow conditions. Uh, this is overcome by using multiple sensor pairs uh, to average out the flow. As you would see here, we have an array of transducers and receivers across the uh, side of the pipe here. And the idea is it can capture uh, an average uh, flow measurement across the uh, cross-sectional area of that pipe. Um, aside from the benefit of uh, helping us deal with less than ideal flows, uh, using this multiple array configuration also uh, provides ultrasonic with the ability to be used 
uh, for custody transfer applications. So these transducers um, that send out these ultrasound signals, uh, there's a little bit of science behind these that we have to be aware of uh, so that we can um, make sure that we have our application right, our installation right, and the process uh, understood so that we know that we're selecting the correct devices. Uh, liquids and gases, as we know, have different densities, uh, and the pulse frequency is going to vary with the state uh, of the process medium. Uh, higher densities, lower densities are going to have a different effect on sound waves. Um, and that, and among the, uh, this issue here, pipe size or configuration uh, can play into the factors uh, that, if, that affect the performance of an ultrasonic meter. A bigger pipe means that there's a farther distance to travel, and as a result, we're going to want lower frequency transmissions from our transducers because lower frequencies are inherently more powerful. Um, a good way to remember the difference uh, between low frequencies and high frequencies is to imagine yourself sitting at a traffic light minding your own business on a nice sunny day and suddenly some uh, young kid comes up in his uh, car with a big honking stereo and uh, you're minding your own business and all you can hear is the bass uh, pumping from a car or two or three vehicles behind you. Um, and this is a good example of how the low frequency sound waves uh, travel all the way to your car where you don't hear the high frequency uh, sounds in the music that the other vehicle is producing. Another issue with ultrasonic here, uh, as I said earlier, you're dealing with the state and the densities. Um, higher densities require more energy to get through, therefore lower frequencies are usually selected uh, when we're dealing with higher density liquids. Uh, gases have their own specific issues uh, with ultrasonic here. Gases have a tendency to attenuate or to mute the signal, uh, so they also require a lower frequency uh, sound wave. Last but not least here, uh, flow rates. Higher flow rates require higher frequencies in order to maintain resolution. Again, we're shooting signals uh, across the pipe at a certain rate, at a slow uh, flow rate. The pulses can uh, slow down and still maintain accuracy, but as we increase our flow rates, we have to add more and more pulses in order to maintain uh, accurate resolution. So we're taking more measurements per period of time uh, in order to maintain accuracy for ultrasonic. Applications for transit time and Doppler comparison here on this screen. Uh, as I said earlier, transit time requires clean liquid and glass, uh, gas flows with few or no solids or bubbles, whereas Doppler is quite the opposite. It actually requires that there are liquids uh, that have solids or bubbles uh, entrained in them from, for them to work. Accuracy uh, ratings are, uh, are here. Uh, uncertainty here is 0.5 to 1% of reading with a repeatability of 0.2. Um, by having that multi-array configuration that we looked at before. Uh, this is something that is specified in the AGA-9 guideline, uh, AGA guidelines. This is the American Gas Association, and they have uh, certain criteria for uh, measurement applications uh, in the oil and gas industry here, and AGA-9 speaks specifically to multi-path multi ultrasonic flow. And if you follow the uh, guidelines by AGA-9, it will increase the accuracy uh, from half to uh, to 1% down to 0.15% and improve the repeatability uh, from 0.2 to 0.02. So a significant advantage gained by using this multi-path uh, approach to ultrasonic measurement. Doppler effect you see here far less than, uh, ranging in 2 to 5% of the calibrated span. Look at uh, the components of an ultrasonic transmitter. Uh, here, there's a few different configurations out there, um, but most of them uh, will have the same common components. They're going to have some form of a, a pipe section, whether it's a school piece or it's pre-built, uh, or perhaps you have a device that clamps onto the pipe. At any rate, you're going to need some some form of pipe for the for the medium to flow through. We'll also have transducers or transmitters and receivers that send and receive 
the ultrasonic pulses, and then electronics housing that has the display and configuration and all the electronics uh, in order to utilize uh, the signals generated by the sensors. Here's a few different installation applications. Uh, kind of collected them all on one image here. Uh, SNPs from the ILM. This is a fairly common uh, version, one of the simpler versions here, where we'll have threadlets uh, on the outside of the pipe, uh, welded on at a 45 degree angle, and then we just screw our transducers uh, into there. And that is probably the most common uh, type of application. It'll look something like this. This is multi-path, of course. Uh, this this version over here would just have uh, one set of sensors, and you see here, uh, this is a variation of, of this installation practice right here. Uh, of particular interest with this one, um, some of you may ask yourselves, well, why is there a transducer on this side of the pipe and a transducer on this side of the pipe in this picture? and also in this picture and in this picture, but on this picture, they're both on the same side of the pipe. This is a unique application for ultrasonic uh, flow transmitters. We talked about uh, ringing uh, when we talked about ultrasonic level, that the transmitter needs a certain amount of time for the pulse uh, to travel from one side to the other, or if it was a level application, we needed a certain amount of time for the pulse to travel to the surface of the of the level and reflect back up to the transducer. And if that space was too small, the transducer was unable to uh, unable to capture and calculate anything that is going on. So we end up having to lower our upper range value or raise our sensor in a level application to avoid that. The same, uh, the same phenomenon occurs in ultrasonic flow as well. So if our pipe diameter is large enough uh, that we have the time required by the electronics of the transmitter in order to compute what's going on, we don't have a problem. We have a transducer on each side of the pipe. We have a large uh, pipe spool here and it works just fine. If we have a situation where we have a pipe that's much, much smaller as we have in this application here, if these transducers were opposite each other on this pipe, there would be no time uh, for the signal uh, to travel. There's just too short of a distance here. And this is an application that overcomes that issue by putting them both on the same side and basically bouncing the sound signal off the back of the pipe wall and receiving it on the, the same side that it was sent from. So this is kind of a unique application uh, and one way you can get around using ultrasonics on pipes that are normally would be too small. Last application we're going to look at here uh, regarding the piping uh, deals with the clamp-on ultrasonic meter here. And there's a few different styles of clamp-on meters, whether it's using a bandit clamp or some type of a mechanical uh, assembly, um, but a very handy, useful tool for doing flow verifications. Uh, you can take a clamp-on style ultrasonic meter. They usually come in a little portable case and you can take it out into the field and clamp it onto, the, uh, onto any appropriately acoustically uh, transmittable pipe uh, and you can verify flow uh, of other meters with a uh, clamp-on style meter. So they can be very, uh, very handy tool for diagnostics, uh, looking for pluggages and verifying flows. Transducer components. Uh, transducers can either be in the process, meaning that they're wetted or touching the process, or clamp-on, meaning that they're on the outside of the pipe and they don't actually touch the process. Um, this image down here is a hybrid. Uh, where we have part of the holder that is uh, permanently affixed to the piping system and, and is actually uh, kind of wetted, whereas the transformer module and this transducer module and the cabling are quick connected to it so that they can be uh, serviced uh, rather easily. So here's a, a smaller version of kind of all the goodies in, in one little package here. So not a lot to say about the transducers. The electronics housing, uh, Similar to most transmitter electronics, uh, responsible for coordinating the pulses or the input signals, uh, receiving feedback uh, from the, the sensors. Uh, it also has all the terminals, buttons, displays uh, that are required for communications, power, output, uh, all that kind of wonderful stuff. So this is all relatively standard. Okay, quick look at the advantages of, and disadvantages of Doppler. Uh, specifically, and then we'll look at the next slide uh, at, at the transit time. OK, 
Okay, uh, advantages of Doppler flow meters, generally non-intrusive, easily to add to an existing line, specifically if there's a clamp on ones. And if they are on the outside, of course, there's gonna be no pressure loss uh, because there's nothing inside the flow stream. Uh, they can be bi-directional, they are linear. They are not affected by viscosity, density, temperature, or pressure. And they are not necessarily affected by the speed of sound in a fluid. Disadvantages, uh, Dopplers are only good for liquids and these liquids must have some bubbles or solids in order for them to work. And they must have sufficient velocity in the flow in order to keep those solids uh, on which it uh, depends on from settling out. And again, just to review the accuracy of the Doppler is two to 5%. Transit time. Oops, a little too far here. Again, non-intrusive, can also be clamped on, no pressure loss, bi-directional, linear, not affected by the same things, not affected by the speed of sound, uh, can be used on large pipe sizes, uh, good for measuring non-conductive fluids, and they have no moving parts. So a pretty good device for actually quite a few applications. Um, ultrasonic, again, liquids, and or gases, depending on the technology. Okay, installation requirements here. We've looked at this on all of our devices here. Uh, broken out the two diagrams here, single, single path piping requirements and multi-path piping requirements. Uh, long story short here, you're gonna find if you compare the numbers that you're gonna have less uh, piping requirements in terms of straight pipe requirements for a multi-path uh, than you will for a single path. So for example, let's look at two elbows not in the same plane, it is about 10 pipe diameters, whereas the same with a multi-path multi sensor here is five. So about half the piping diameters required for a multi-path style. But again, just like any other uh, measuring device we've looked at, um, where we put it in the piping system is important. We wanna make sure that we have full pipes. Uh, we don't want heat saturating our transmitters and uh, member variables. Okay, to ensure accurate performance, uh, the manufacturer of course will su suggest that the spool have 10 to 20 diameters upstream and, and five diameters downstream. If you haven't caught on by now, um, most of the devices we look at so far uh, have about five diameters downstream and the upstream requirements just change basically on the configuration of the piping itself. Uh, notice lower numbers for multi-path, of course, and remember we can also reduce these numbers by using flow conditioners, things like straightening vanes. Okay, error gas in, entrainment or entrapment. Uh, similar to other applications here, we want to make sure that we don't have bubbles in liquids and we don't want to have liquids in gases, so we want to make sure that when it's installed, uh, we um, install it properly so that we get good flow here. So the ILM talks about a couple of things uh, with this particular diagram. Um, what does that say here? Uh, for liquid meters, we don't want this. Uh, we don't want bubbles or gas, so we mount at the highest point, not point. That could be subliminal. Uh, near the outlet of a vertical pipe or somewhere where we're not going to get bubbles. Um, the ILM goes on to also say that by placing an orifice meter below, uh, configuration like meter B here, um, we could uh, create a higher pressure area which would keep the bubbles from coming in, which would ensure uh, that we would have full pipe and help to eliminate that particular issue. Uh, heat, again, we've talked about this before, it can also affect the transmitter, so consider the mounting position as well. So if this is a high temperature line, there is a possibility that this transmitter could get hot. Um, you might want to hang it upside down or sideways, something like that. Just to go back to that one installation, I've already spoken to this here. Um, we have a pipe that's too small. Uh, a couple of ways to do it. This is the configuration that we looked at before where we mounted the transducers on the same side of the pipes and we bounced that ultrasonic wave off the back wall. A second way to deal with pipes that are too small uh, is on diagram A here where we have the transducers on opposite sides of what is essentially a fast uh, loop bypass. Uh, and we can make this as wide as we need to make it in order to uh, accommodate the, the time travel that we need to uh, facilitate for the uh, electronics to be able to uh, 
uh, utilize the signals. So a couple of applications here that we can use uh, in small bite applications. Again, the idea is to avoid ringing. Excuse me. <clears throat> Here's an image of a rather fancy uh, clamp-on style meter here. And a couple things that we have to be concerned about when we're installing these clamp-on ones. It's also important when you're mounting permanent ones, uh, alignment is very, very critical. So uh, an application where it's clamped on, you of course have adjustments that you can do in order to uh, ensure that you have proper alignment. And transmitter electro electronics will usually have uh, some type of an alignment tool in there uh, that will verify uh, your signals going back and forth before you lock this all down. Um, but the requirement for alignment is the same whether it's strapped on or permanently mounted. Uh, and I have worked on jobs where uh, the piping, um, the threadlets that are mounted on the piping uh, have changed their angle as the welds have cooled and has thrown off the alignment and the piping had to be reworked. So uh, alignment is very critical. And the second most critical thing about any of these ultrasonic meters that we um, have talked about is the ability of the sound wave to leave the transducer and actually go through the process. Uh, the way this works is it's going to reflect uh, off of anything that it sees after a void. So in order to avoid having a void, uh, ultrasonic transducers, uh, specifically clamp-on ones, have something called a, a coupling fluid or a coupling grease or a coupling tape. And the idea uh, of this coupling is to fill any voids between the transducer and the pipe wall. If there were a void in here anywhere, the ultrasonic pulse would pass through the little bit of coupling into the void hit the back side of that void and it would determine that it has gone through something and it would turn around uh, and reflect back immediately. Um, so this has to be a good, solid, sonically conductive coupling uh, done right here. And that's one of the main PMs uh, if you have strap-on style ultrasonic transmitter is, uh, especially in a hot pipe, sometimes that coupling will ooze out. Um, it can be a tape which is a little better, but lots of times it's just a, a grease type uh, material that is uh, put in there between the transducer and the pipe wall. Okay, uh, once again, strap-on style transducers must be firmly strapped to the side of a sonically conductive pipe. And the ILM uh, does spend a little bit of time talking about sonically conductive pipe. Most applications uh, that I can think of are going to be sonically conductive pipe. Uh, unless it's porous uh, and I don't, I can't think of an application off the top of my head of uh, it, perhaps clay pipes maybe might not work, but any steel pipe, uh, fiberglass pipe, glass line pipe should not be a problem for a strap-on style uh, ultrasonic meter here. Okay, you gotta make sure that we establish an acoustically efficient sound conductive path between the transducer and the pipe. So again, sonic coupling is very important. Uh, ringing around the pipe is the consequence of not having that sonic coupling in there. Uh, it's essentially a pulse blockage that occurs because of the layer uh, of air uh, has got caught in between the transducer and the pipe wall and that causes the sound wave to either be reflected back or to be refracted in some way that it cannot be picked up by the receiver. Okay, coupling fluid again or tape or whatever the ILM mentions there. I've never used tape. I know the ILM mentions tape. Most of the time it's a grease type compound and actually on some jobs that I've been on we just use a common product. Uh, Dow 732 is a number that comes to mind. I'm not sure if that's an accurate number or not. But it's essentially a low temperature or high temperature grease. Uh, something to fill that void at any rate. Okay, maintenance and calibration. Ultrasonics have no moving parts, so maintenance is relatively low. Uh, they are generally self-maintaining and have the capability to do self-checks. And we've talked about several devices that do their own self-checks. And when they run through the self-checks, they check uh, gain, not Guyan, uh, signal quality, the signal to noise ratio, uh, velocity profile, and verifying the speed of sound are all the common procedures that are done in electronic verification. 
calibration. Uh, again, not much you can do. Uh, they're calibrated against a master meter or some type of approving system that will result in a calibration factor that we would input into the transmitter to make adjustments. Uh, for custody transfer applications, you will have to calibrate usually every four years, but that will depend on uh, the circumstances of your particular application and any legislation or uh, standards that you might be following. Here we have a couple of videos. Hopefully we can get these to pop up without too much uh, trouble here. substances are transported and distributed in piping systems every single day. They can include solvents and chemicals, vegetable oils in the food sector, coolants in primary industry, or petrochemical products. The fluids flowing through pipes often have completely different properties. Therefore, different principles are required for their measurement. One principle is flow measurement based on the differential transit time method using ultrasound. The basic physics of this principle can be traced back to the English physicist and Nobel Prize winner Lord Raleigh. His book on the theory of sound, published in 1877, describes the propagation of sound waves in solids and gases. Here is how this measurement method works. Inside the ultrasonic flow meter, pairs of sensors are fitted across from each other in the measuring tube. Each sensor can alternately transmit and receive an ultrasonic signal. Simultaneously, the transit times of these signals are measured. The ultrasonic signals are generated with piezoelectric crystals applying a voltage. Conversely, a piezoelectric crystal creates a voltage when an ultrasonic signal impacts the sensor. By increasing the number of sensor pairs, it's possible to accurately detect and mathematically compensate for flow profile distortions over the entire pipe cross-section. When there is no flow, the signal transit times are the same upstream and downstream. Once the fluid starts to flow in the measuring tube, the ultrasonic signals are accelerated in the direction of the flow and decelerated against the flow. As a result, the ultrasonic signals now have different transit times, less time in the direction of flow and more time against the flow. Therefore, the differential transit time measured by the sensors is directly proportional to the flow velocity in the pipe. Together with the known tube cross-section, the actual flow volume can then be calculated. The greater the flow velocity, the greater the measured time difference between the two ultrasonic signals. For ultrasonic flow measurement, the sensors do not necessarily have to be fitted into the pipe wall. With a clap-on system, for example, the sensors are fastened directly onto the outside of the pipe. They can be retrofitted at any time without interrupting the process. With clap-on sensors, the ultrasonic signal is passed directly through the pipe wall and into the fluid. The signal continues through the fluid is reflected on the opposite pipe wall and then measured by the second sensor. In this example, with the two traverse installation, the clap-on design is unique because flow rates can be measured in very large pipes up to four meters in diameter. This possibility increases the areas of application, for example, in the water and hydroelectric industry. Flexible mounting, process safety, and cost effectiveness are the distinctive advantages of ultrasonic flow measurement. For all applications,
applications. We have the right solution. Address and housing. Perfect. So that was one. Let's look at the second one here. By advertising on YouTube, I grow my business by reaching my most important customers, people like Allison. Theory of operation. How does an ultrasonic Doppler flow meter work? Let's give credit to Christian Johann Doppler, a 19th century Austrian physicist known for his paper on the Doppler effect. Let's update his analogy to perhaps something more modern. I cannot see the video. No video? No video. No. Changed as the okay. train raced towards and then away from you. First, the pitch became higher, then lower. Let's figure this out here. How's that? Yeah, that's better. Let's update his analogy to perhaps something more modern. Have you ever heard a train go by recently? Remember how the pitch changed as the train raced towards and then away from you? First, the pitch became higher, then lower. This change in pitch resulted from a shift in frequency of sound wave, as illustrated in the following picture. So, as the train approaches, the sound waves are compressed towards the observer. The interval between waves diminish, which translates into an increase in frequency or pitch. As the train recedes, the sound waves are stretched relative to the observer, causing the train's pitch to decrease. By the change in pitch of the approaching train, you can determine if it's coming near or speeding away. Now, if you can measure the rate of change of pitch, you can also estimate the train's speed. Let's consider the same situation with a clamp-on ultrasonic Doppler flow meter. This technique is to clamp it on the outside of the pipe, but the process liquid does require that it has some suspended gases or solid to reflect your signal. Now, of course, the advantages of the technology that it's clamped on the outside of the pipe, there's no pressure drop and there's no obstruction of the flow. The way this thing works is the Doppler meter continuously transmits high-frequency sound that travels through the pipe wall and into the flowing liquid. Sound is reflected back to the center from the suspended solids or bubbles that are in the process liquid. If the fluid is in motion, the echoes return at an alternated frequency proportion to flow velocity. Doppler flow meters continuously measure this frequency shift to calculate your flow. So what we've learned is an ultrasonic Doppler flow meter must have suspended solids or aeration in a process liquid for it to work. Generically speaking, the difference between the brands, but most brands require that liquids have at least a hundred parts per million of suspended solids, not dissolved solids, suspended solids that are about 75 to 100 microns in size. No suspended solids or aeration, you get no signal. So the Doppler flow meter works best on closed full pipe applications that are either heavily aerated or with lots of solids. So for example, slurries, paper stock, raw surge are ideal for an ultrasonic Doppler flow meter. Traditional applicable flow meters would be, for example, in wastewater, be surge and sludge, uh, and in mining applications and fluid applications where there's always a lot of suspended solids. Here are some Generic examples of ultrasonic Doppler flow meters. It comes in portable versions, heavy duty, light duty, as well as dedicated wall mounted units for monitoring process controls and inventory. As you can see from our application guide, Doppler flow meters work best at dirty liquid, slurry applications, they're available as portable, wall mounted, and for weatherproof enclosures. At Instruments Direct, if you have any other questions about the theory of operation, about ultrasonic Doppler flow meters, or any other.
All righty, that is the end of today's uh, end of today's presentation. Have a good day, everybody. Have a good day, Tanner. Thank you.